Are you getting ready to take the Praxis General Science exam? That's exam code 5436. My name is Anjali Couture, and I'm a biology professor and test prep expert here at study.com. In this video, we're going to walk through three sample diversity of life problems from the life science section of the exam so that you're ready come test day. So let's get into it. All right, so let's start with our first question. It reads, which of the following processes would most likely occur if a plant is in a dark environment for an extended period of time? So when we're thinking about this problem, we need to think about photosynthesis because a plant in the dark is not going to be in ideal conditions. Why? Because in order for a plant to survive, it needs to undergo photosynthesis to make the food that it needs to survive. And in the dark, it's missing one of the key components of photosynthesis, which is light. So let me write out the equation just so we can remember it and think about it. So in order for a plant to undergo photosynthesis and make the sugars it needs to survive, it needs light. In a dark environment, it doesn't have that, so photosynthesis is definitely going to be impacted. So knowing that, let's go through our answer choices. A says the rate of photosynthesis would increase promoting growth. Now we know that isn't true because the rate of photosynthesis would decrease. If it doesn't have what it needs, that being light, Photosynthesis isn't going to happen, which is not going to allow the plant to make the sugars it needs to grow and develop. So A is not the correct answer. B, on the other hand, is the correct answer. The rate of photosynthesis would decrease stunting growth. When a plant doesn't have what it needs to do photosynthesis, the rate, is going to, the rate of photosynthesis is going to decrease and the plant is not going to be able to grow and develop. So B is the right answer, but let's keep reading. C says the plant would start to consume more water to compensate for the lack of light. Now, water is definitely one of the requirements for photosynthesis, but during the light reactions, light is used to split water in order to, I mean, form oxygen, yes, but in order to get those electrons moving and get them onto our electron carriers. So consuming more water isn't going to help compensate for the lack of light. We need the light because the light is our source of energy. So consuming more water isn't going to do anything. So the plant is not going to do that because it doesn't actually compensate for the lack of light. D says the plant would produce more oxygen to stimulate photosynthesis. That is not true. Um, there's The plant producing more oxygen isn't going to cause the plant to stimulate photosynthesis. Um, we see that the plant does produce oxygen during the process of photosynthesis, but again, that process of producing oxygen requires light. So the plant cannot produce more oxygen if there's not light there. So that answer is not correct. So this question really looks at our understanding of photosynthesis, but also what's happening in the light reactions. All right, so our second question reads, a science teacher is planning a hands-on experiment for her students to explain the concept of transpiration in plants. Which of the following activities would best demonstrate this process? Of course, to answer this question, we need to know what is transpiration. And with transpiration, we're looking at a plant releasing water. So how, uh, how could we see a plant is releasing water? Well, we would want to be able to visualize this water maybe as condensation. So let's read our answer choices and see if we can find the best answer. A says, placing a plant in a sealed plastic bag and observing the inside of the bag for condensation after several hours. That's exactly what I was just talking about. If a plant is releasing water through the stoma, through the little pores in the leaves, and we want to see that water, if we trap that water in a plastic bag, for example, we can visualize it as condensation. So A sounds, oops, A sounds like the best answer to me. But let's keep reading just to make sure. 
B says placing a plant in a pot of soil and observing its growth over several weeks. The goal is to demonstrate transpiration, not growth. So B is not really getting at transpiration at all. C says placing a plant in a dark room and observing any changes in leaf color. While this is cool, it's not dealing with transpiration at all. It's really more so looking at the impact of light or no light on a plant. So that is not looking at transpiration. And then D says placing a plant in a pot without soil and observing if it can still perform photosynthesis. Again, the goal is to look at transpiration and visualize transpiration transpiration. So we're not really looking at the impact of soil on photosynthesis, the impact of light on photosynthesis. We're looking at how do we visualize this water that the plant is releasing. So A is our best answer. All right, so our next question reads, in the context of phylogenetic trees, which of the following statements is true? A reads, organisms with a closer common ancestor are less related than those with a distant common ancestor. So I'm hoping that right off the bat, you're like, nope, that isn't true, because organisms with a closer common ancestor are more closely related than those with a distant common ancestor. So A is definitely not right. B says, the branch lengths on a phylogenetic tree always represent the amount of genetic change. So with this one, branch lengths can indicate genetic change where a longer branch means there's been more genetic change, but that's not always the case. That's not universally true. So because it says always, I'm going to say mm, that doesn't sound like the best answer. C says phylogenetic trees can provide information about the relative timing of species divergences. Now, for me, that sounds pretty good. Yes, they can tell us a little bit about the timing at which species diverged from one another, right? We use our different nodes and branches to show uh, the most recent common ancestor and the species that diverged from them. So that sounds like the best answer, but let's read D before we draw our conclusion. D says, all species at the tips of the branches on a phylogenetic tree are currently living species. So with this one, not all species at the tip are currently living. The, a phylogenetic tree can include living and extinct species. So it could be, depending on the you know, phylogenetic tree that we're looking at, it could be that there are extinct species at the tips of the phylogenetic tree. So that's not always true either. So our best answer is C, phylogenetic trees can provide information about the relative timing of species divergences. I hope this was helpful, and if you're looking for more ways to study, you can check out our other videos here on YouTube and make your way over to study.com to check out our Praxis test prep courses. As a study.com member, you get full access to hundreds of practice problems like the ones we did today, plus targeted instruction, and test-taking strategies to help you do as well as possible on exam day. Finally, we want to hear from you, so if you found this video helpful, please like and subscribe, and let us know down below in the comments if there's other topics that you want us to cover. Until next time, good luck and happy studying!